Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we, uh, God, we thank you for Jesus. Um, Father, I think sometimes we do take for uh, granted the blessing of the blood, uh, the gift of life, the gift of forgiveness, uh, the gift of being made new. Uh, Father, the gift of a new start, the gift of being made right in your eyes, Father. God, thank you. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. The lifeblood that was given for my sin and for the sin of those in this room and all mankind that choose you. And so, Father, I pray tonight that we, we never take for granted. God, we never uh, allow the blood of Christ to lose its weight, to lose its depth, um, God, that it should have in our own lives. Uh, Father, as we think about what you have done, uh, God, and the gift of life that you've given. We love you. Ask your Holy Spirit to guide us tonight. Uh, Lord, as we continue to walk through the Calvary Road, help us to be obedient, but God, help us also to share our heart's desires about what you're doing and what you're going to do in and through our lives. In the name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you tonight. Thank you for being here. And uh, uh, Clay, do you have me back there? You got me? Okay. Um, uh, if you've uh, if you got your books, if you'll turn to page 127, that's where we're going to be tonight in our books. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I know some had an opportunity to share last week about um, about what God has done in your life and through this time of revival or through this book. And I want to open up the floor and give somebody else an opportunity. If you want to share about what God has done or what God is doing in and through your life, um, right now I want to give you that opportunity to do so. So who wants to be first? Okay. Right, right, yeah. But like when they talk about, um, you know, the speck and the log, you know, the speck and else in the log. In here, they say you're a fellow believer, but you're you're supposed to be that way no matter, right? No matter if it's right. It's me and him, or you know, if I'm not a believer and she is, right. Sure. It's not, Absolutely. It's not based on whether or not we're both, you know, walking on the same level or right. or right. two different ends of the spectrum. Yeah. That's still, because I didn't realize that the way, like, and she has, you know, you know I've got respect, you've got a lot. <laughs> Just that. I didn't realize that, you know, the way she reacts to what she thinks is wrong with me would be a sin on her part. Yeah, right, right. I still, you know, I didn't know that he, the way he <coughs> reacted to somebody else's, that that, that, you know, that's between, uh, that would be between me and God, and the way she reacted to it would be between her and God. Sure. And she, God would probably, or would like to use her to help clear that, you know, from me, but she would be the one to do it. If I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what we've, uh, wow, that's good. Um, that's good and loud. All right. Uh, yeah. What, what the whole thing is, it's a believer to believer. Okay. And the reason for that is, is because we're not, it's not that you're judging someone, but it's the fact of expecting someone that's not a believer to respond like a believer is not even on the page anyway. So you wouldn't even confront somebody about that. So I'm saying, and so what he's referring to is a believer to believer, uh, in confronting someone that in other words, the log and the spec situation um, is between two believers. It's not necessarily between a believer and an unbeliever. But yes, the, the purpose of that is uh, the reason, and was you here that night? We talked about all that? Okay. Um, you know, of course, is to, to, number one, have compassion, <laughs> but also deal with your own sin uh, that's in your own life. And uh, go ahead. Wrong and them the same, you should, you know, 
Sure, considering they're a believer, yes. What? Considering they're a believer, yes. Now, you should have compassion on everybody. You should, you should love everybody regardless of where they are. But we can't, it's kind of that, that, and I tell our kids this all the time, you know, we go to a restaurant or we go somewhere and somebody looks like the world and they want to, oh, they're doing this. I say, well, we don't know that they're believers. You know, they look like the world. They may be the world, you know. And so we can't expect the world to live like Jesus because they're not. They don't have those convictions. There are no biblical worldview for them. So I'm saying, and so the way we respond, not that we shouldn't respond to someone but let's just, uh, without, I'm trying to think about what would be a good example. But, but if you were going to confront, the odds of you confronting someone that is a non-believer, unless they're a family member, or unless they're someone that's really close to you, and you've got a concern for that, the standard is different because they don't have a biblical foundation to work from. There is no... Uh, being made right with God based on their personal sin, it say they need to come to God because Scripture tells us if you're not if if you're not a child of God, you're His enemy. And so there's a different perspective on that situation. I'm trying not to get way off deep in a hole, but um, but so am I. Am I kind of guiding in that direction of where you're? Right. Still, the way you look at what he thinks that they are doing or have done or whatever that is the sin, it still that's when then God has you respond. To that's right. Action. That's right. Yes. And, you know, yes. Right. Right. And yeah. Yeah. What she's doing, if she wasn't right. A believer, that's not yes. Her that's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 You, your heart's be made right with God, regardless of what someone else is doing. That's right. That's right. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Testimony. Something God's done in your life, or something God's doing in your life. Okay. I think that, and I think sometimes we talk about sin, but it's omission as well as sin becoming things that I do wrong that I shouldn't do, but things that I don't do that I'm supposed to do. And, and it's really saying, hey, look, you might not be all looking for him, but it really is. Yeah. And that's, it's become real to me in so many ways. And I've started to look at them, and, and it's, it, it's just, it's just, I, I, it, it just is. Sure. I, Sure, sure. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The book, the book is very powerful. It goes back to what we've talked about before. Um, uh, reading this book every year would be good for you. Um, it's, it would be good for us. It would be good for myself. Uh, because it deals with things in our life that is an everyday struggle. Sin uh, and being cleansed of that and knowing how to walk in a place of brokenness, knowing how to continue to be in a state of humility and, and those things, which is all center part of the Christian faith. It's all about being who Christ has called us to be. And, of course, if we can't get us out of the way, God can't do what he needs to do um, because we're the problem. And, uh, and so, you know, the more that we can be gone, the more God can do. Um, and this book's a great book for that, uh, very much so. So, yeah, it's great that you've started over. Uh, it's kind of like I've, I've, I know Kenneth has uh, done my utmost for his highest, the Oswald Chambers study. I've done it many times, and I always change pen colors. And it's amazing how God will give you something different, even out of something that you read that maybe he didn't hit you with that first time. But the second time, it's like, wow, I don't know how that cleaned me out like it did. Uh, but, uh, but it did. And so, yeah, the book will be that way as well. That's, that's great that you've, you've started over. And, you know, it, too, it makes that old man say, hey, I did a sin. Yeah. You know. Right. And, and, and like what he says, call a sin a sin. Don't, 
Yeah. Right. Matter if it's whatever, it's yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, he talked about that tonight. All right, somebody else. Uh, one more. We got time for one more. Uh, somebody wants to share about what God's doing in their life and through this book or through something else, maybe. Right. Yeah. 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 Or created by him anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. That that unconditional love thing is tough. <laughs> That's why I quit looking at it. Yeah. You think I'm kidding. I'm serious. I had to turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. I used to keep up with it. I've got to where I don't keep up with it at all. I couldn't tell you who's doing what right now, which may sound crazy from my standpoint, but I don't. It got to the point that I couldn't do it no more. And uh, it, it was a good way to ruin your day was to pull up a news channel and figure out what's going on in the world. Yeah. And so I still see the big things as they come across, but I don't get on I don't get on the different sites now and scroll and see who's saying what and who's trying to impeach who and who's trying I just so yeah. Yep, be done with it. I can't stand it. I got too much to take care of on my own without having to worry about all that. So anyway. All right, good deal. Uh sounds like God's continued doing some good things. Look, just because the book's coming to an end, just because our revival meetings were the week uh two weeks ago at this point, uh don't let this get stale in your life, okay? I'm going to encourage you to read it again or to, if nothing else, um, continue to think about the things that God's done in your life through this book. Maybe go back through and pull one thing out of each chapter that maybe you start or that you underline two or three times or, uh, or something that maybe you just remember, God did this in my life from this book. Meditate on that for a while. Use that. Allow, pray through that week after week after week and allow God to use that in your heart and and uh, don't give up on what God's doing in your life right now because think about how far you've come to get here, okay? Think about what sins you've confessed, what places of brokenness you've walked through, what things you're like, you've allowed God to change in your life. Don't revert back to where you were and have to start over. Allow God to continue to build on that platform that he has set in your life right now uh, and continue to move forward. That, that's some of the way that you cut out your spiritual roller coaster is to continue to build on what God has done. Uh, and of course, you can do that through, uh, through of course, walking in humility and, and brokenness um, and being in a place of being spirit-filled. Um, and so I encourage you to do that in your life. All right, page 125. I'm sorry, I think I told you 126 earlier, 127. 125 is where we left off in justifying God. And uh, we talked about the um, we talked about the tax collector last week, and and how we uh, tend to point him out. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, we're the tax collector, uh, and we we got, we talked about that last week, and that was very convicting. I know in my life, um, you know, the thing on page one twenty four, he said, "Look, unconscious sin is nonetheless sin with God, and it separates us from Him." And so it's just that realization, even though you may not know it, it's still sin. It doesn't matter. It's still sin. And so pray and ask God to reveal those things to you. All right. 125 there at the bottom of the page. Justifying God. Okay. Justifying God. This brings us to the tax collector. Uh, with all that God says about the human heart and our minds, we can see that his confession of sin was simply a justifying of God or an admission that what God said of him was true. So what sticks out to you about that? How can you relate? The truth of the matter is it's true about ourselves, right? We're, ju we're just like him as well, all right? The human heart is wicked, and we talked about that last week. And it's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to say, yeah, I know that, but it's another thing to settle that, okay, to understand uh, that, uh, uh, that the sin in our life, the justification of our own human heart and our minds is, in fact, true of what God says about it, okay? Okay. Um, 
perhaps the Pharisee not used to believe that what God said about humanity was really true of him. Uh, but the Holy Spirit had shown him things in his life that proved, top page 126, God was right. And he was what? Broken. Not only did he justify God in all that he had said, but he doubtlessly justified God in all the chastening judgments God had brought upon him. So what about that? What's the difference there? What's the difference? We kind of get a clear picture there of the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector. What's the difference? Yeah, he... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He, he recognized the sin that God said was there. And instead of pushing it away like he was, he, like it wasn't, he accepted it and it brought him to a place of what? Brokenness, right? Yeah, he, he, was, he was absolutely broken over what God did. Nehemiah said, um, yet you have been righteous in all uh, that has come upon us and you have dealt faithfully and we have acted what? Wickedly. That's still true of us today. God is still faithful. He has done all that he has done for us. And yet we are still wicked people, right? It's just to go ahead and, and uh, address that heart once again, the wickedness of our own heart. And so somebody read that next paragraph. True brokenness is ever the nature of true confession of sin. Stop right there. I should have told you to read the next line. True brokenness is ever the nature of true confession of sin. Can you have one without the other? You cannot. So I often we said, God, I'm sorry for what I did, but there was no brokenness. Anybody else done that in their life? Yeah. Anybody else done that last week? I'll confess. I did that last week. Okay. Yeah. God, I did this, you know, and I'm sorry. My own selfish ways. God, I get tired of doing this. No brokenness. No remorse. No, this has got to stop in my life. Okay. I'm being just open and honest with you. Oh, yeah, 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 it's been butts, but, but it becomes, it, it's, we are so easily uh, desensitized to the confession of our own sin that it becomes a routine. Does that sound correct? Okay, does that sound like you? Sounds like me. You know, I kind of get in that routine of saying, God, forgive me for, since the book, again, selfish ways. I know we've talked about that, right? We've talked about our own selfishness, our own self-sins. And in the, yeah, or judgment of somebody else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you get in that thing that it's like when, when you first really, when I know when in reading this book, it just breaks your heart. You know, and for some of you, tears ran. It did for me, okay? Just literally brokenhearted over seeing my sin at the foot of the cross. And then as time passes by, that same confession, which normally, if we still confess it, it means we didn't repent of it the first time. But we understand that we are selfish people and working through that. Our hearts are wicked. Um, and we're going to talk about, <laughs> we're going to talk about putting Christ in that place tonight. But, but, but coming to a place of brokenness over our sin should never be something that is a place of repetition and it doesn't bother us. Sadly, we get that way in the church. As Christians, we get that way because the reason I know that is because I preach here three times a week. <laughs> okay? And, and you can tell the difference. You know the difference. You yourselves, all of you probably in this room have come to this altar broken. I'm talking about pouring yourself out before God broken. And then there's times that we come to the altar, and it's not that I'm negating that, okay? I understand your heart, and it's not that there's always has to be tears and, like Scripture says, gnashing of teeth, okay? Uh, but there, when you come to a place of brokenness, you're broke, right? Yes. And so we ought to be that way. It, there should not be a place of repetition in our life to where we are just going through the motions for a lack of a better term in our life when it comes to confessing sin in our own lives. And so true brokenness is the ever nature of true confession of sin. That, that broken heart, that achiness knowing that I'm sitting at the foot of the cross. I see my Jesus. I see what they have done to him. I see what my sin has done to him. 
the remorse, the brokenness, the hurt, the uh, uh, the sadness within my own heart that I cause that should not be something that I take lightly. But yet it gets to a place to where it does, if that makes sense. We are all there at times in our life to where it becomes too casual. Well, God broke me over this, really. Yeah, you know, and then we're going about it like it ain't nothing. Well, I hate to tell you, but you've been broke before and you know what it's like. I've seen you broke. God's seen you broke. You know what it feels like to be broke. And so when we come to a place of confessing our sin, repenting of our sin, true brokenness should be with that. Now, whether or not, that, 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 whether or not that's an emotional state or not is, is irrelevant, okay? But it is the place of true uh, aching, repentant, um, just in, in a place of all of who I am and what I have done before God. Every time I confess my sin. And I think the only way we can do that, and he's going to talk about that. The only way that we can do that is to put ourselves continuously at the foot of the cross. Because that's the only thing that really gets my attention. I don't mind telling you, okay? I have to go there in my own mind, in my own vision, on my knees before God, however it is. Look, a lot of times, when I pray, a lot of times I'll pause at the beginning. Y'all probably notice that. I don't say nothing for a minute or two. I'm trying to take myself to that place. I'm trying to visualize that in my mind. I'm trying to take myself to a place uh, of seeing God uh, and talk to him that way. And so as we confess our sins, as we come to him in this place, we need to recognize what true brokenness is. And it's not something that we just talk about. It's something we experience, it's something that we walk through, and it's something that should never be uh, casual in our life. Okay? Go ahead, Sarah Martha, read the rest of it. It is the confession that my sin is not just a mistake, a slip, or something that is really foreign to my heart. A thought or action is not really like me. It is something that reveals the real I. It shows me to be a proud, rotten, unclean thing. God says I am. It is really like me to have such thoughts and do such things. Okay. That says casual all over it. That says content. That says what? I'm just going through the motion, right? Yeah. That's exactly what he's saying. It, 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 it's, it's the confession of my sin that it's not a mistake. It's not a slip up. It's not something that is foreign to me, right? Uh, it's not something that's just not like me. It, it, it reveals who I really am. It reveals the core of who I really am, the heart that I really have. The, the, uh, I, I love that, well, I hate, but I love the way that he writes this. It shows me the proud, rotten, unclean thing God says I am. It really is like me to have such thoughts and do such things. Have you, you've been there. I can't believe that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I thought that. I can't believe I put myself in that situation. Well, we should believe it because that's the depths of us. That is me, okay? Remember, me's the problem. John's the problem. In this relationship, John is the problem, okay? I talk to God often about that. I wish you could make John go bye-bye. Just take over, right? I wish I could. I wish I could pull a lever and make it gone, right? Uh, and it would be easy to do that, but God didn't create us that. He created us to make our own choices. And so, but we have to recognize who we are. That doesn't mean that we walk around like this all the time because we're, we're, we're nothing before God, okay? But what that does mean is recognize our sin is real and it's purposeful and, and, and there is a reason behind it. And it's because I am allowing me to make decisions. And when I allow me to make decisions, they're terrible. They're bad. And I always have to go to the foot of the cross with them because I've done something stupid or dumb, okay? And so recognizing that in our own life, that takes us from that casual, well, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I knew better, you know, but it's, uh, yeah. All right. Forgive me for that. It happens, right? Are you driving down the road and it's casual, right? It should break our heart. It should break our heart. It should be that thing of, of understanding 
that that is our own selfish pride, our own driven self, the thing that God is trying to take out of us. That is that old self, as Paul says, okay? We're supposed to be putting on the new self, not the old self. And so when we sin, that is allowing the old self to peer itself out, okay? All right. Somebody else, somebody want to say something about that or add to that? Or do we all just need to gather at the altar? <laughs> I kind of feel that way. <laughs> Sir? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. Never going to be removed. We're never going to callous over, well, I'll take that back. We have callous over a lot of the generations of what sin has done to the world. But it's still wired in there, hardwired into our souls and into our hearts. Yeah. That we seek out Jesus Christ and put across. Sure, uh, absolutely. And what it really means to yeah. seek him out. I mean, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. I talked to a guy. I kind of got a head start on y'all. I already know who my one is. Uh, talked to a guy this week um, about that, uh, about that hole in his life. And, um, you know, tr trying to make a connection there because I know that that's, it exists. It's real. That hole, that natural draw to something, okay? And uh, we all have that. And, and some of you... Uh, just like, I come up in a household, of, and you know that, how I was raised, okay? But, but I also walked away from God. And I also knew what it was like to long for Him again, okay? Um, and so, uh, and to be so far away from Him. And so, understanding that, I tried to fill it with all kind of stuff. And it didn't work. It didn't last. Uh, from money to women to alcohol to you try to find it i tried i never did any drugs but uh tried to buy stuff and fix it new trucks toys you name it i tried it it didn't work it did not work there was always that hold exactly what you're talking about that natural you are hardwired made to come to the foot of the cross and uh, until we do that there is no completeness within us a absolutely kurt um yeah david says there uh when he was confessing his sin, look, look what he said there at the bottom of page 126. Against you and you only have I sinned. Now think about that. Think about that. Against you and you only have I sinned. What does that say to you? You say, well, duh, that's pretty simple. No, somebody elaborate on that a little bit. David realized he had made a mistake. Okay. Yeah, but but was it a mistake? No, it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing that when we sin, it's against God and it's intentional. Um, and so, yeah. So let us not fear then to make such a confession. Where God convicts us that we need to confess, thinking that it will, quote unquote, let Jesus down. Satan loves to use that. So you use that in your life. Yep, he has in mind. Yeah, you're going to let God down. You're going to let Jesus down by doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yep, rather reverse is true. God gets glory out of such confessions for we declare him right. This brings us to a new experience and a victory of Christ for it declares afresh that nothing good dwells in me. That is what? In my flesh. Romans 7, 18. Here you go. This is the, this is the big deal right here. It brings us to a place where what? We give up trying to make our incorrupt, uh, inc uh, 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 inc incorrigible selves holy. Okay. We quit trying to make our rotten, no good, 
un, right, undeserving selves holy. And then what do we do? Where we take Jesus to be our holiness and his life to be our life. So we've got to come to that place. And recognize that you and I, we cannot make ourselves holy. We can't do it. And we can't make ourselves righteous either. Why? Because the law <laughs> couldn't even do that. And if the law can't make you righteous, you sure can't make yourself righteous. I can't make myself righteous. You and I are made righteous by who? Christ, right? Absolutely. Jesus is the one that made you and I righteous. Therefore, he made us holy, brought us, made us sacred before him, right? Uh, we take the life of Christ, to be our own holiness. And we take his life to be our life. What's that say to you? What does that mean to you? Yeah, we're nothing without him. There's nothing good in us. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Suit up. Put on the armor of Christ. Walk in that each and every day. A absolutely. Somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, you come to that place, and, and that's, that's that place of saying, okay, I can't do this no more. That's that place saying, I've tried, and I just can't do it. I can't keep up. I can't. I can't make myself appear clean before God. I did that for a lot of years. A lot of years. Checked a lot of boxes. I've shared that with you. Uh, tried to do the quote unquote Christian thing because it was the right thing to do. Yeah, I was saved. I didn't believe that I was going to hell. And I, don't, I still don't think I was going to hell. But I have a, had a bad outlook on what the Christian life looked like. And it's because I was trying to make myself holy before God. Instead of recognizing that I myself am not holy. And I can't make myself holy. But I can take the life of Christ in place of my own life. And he can make me holy. See the difference? There's a difference in those two. Does that make sense? Yes? Confusing? Okay. All right. All right. Good deal. A Sir? A little of both. A little of both. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's that recognizing who we really are. And, and it goes back to what he's talked about throughout this book of, of you. We're not worthy. We're not worthy of what Christ did for us. We're not worthy of the blood that he shed. We're not worthy of of any good blessings that he has given us. Um, and we try our own humanistic nature is to try to make ourselves worthy to him. And the truth of the matter is we can't. Because if we could make ourselves worthy, then Jesus would have never needed to come. Make sense? Well, that was the whole law. You know, the whole law was, uh, in a sense... It wasn't trying to achieve righteousness because it could never be achieved through the law. Paul tells us that, okay? Um, but it was the thing of the law was, was to set in a place to kind of begin to correct the lifestyles and the lives of the people that God was trying to point to him. Um, and, and so if the law could not make us righteous before him, there's definitely nothing you and I can do. I mean, there's no other standard any greater. I mean, the law was kind of the main standard up until Christ came. And so if the law can't hang it, there's nothing I can do to ever add up because if we start trying to make ourselves holy before a holy God, where's the bar? Make sense? I mean, you know, is the bar here? Is it here? Is it up here? Is it way up there? Is it in the top of that oak tree out front? I mean, where's the bar? How much can you do? What all does need to happen uh, in order to make ourselves holy before God? And so it's not possible. And so even after Christ, we continue that lifestyle. We continue that same thought pattern of, I've got to do these things so that I pray holy before God. Well, that's not the case at all because we can't ever do enough. Even with Jesus, we can't appear before God holy. He appears before God holy before us, okay? And so it's recognizing that I'm, on a, I'm a squirrel on a treadmill, on a, on a uh, squirrel cage running around and around and around. Of trying to make myself holy before God. It's settling that in my mind. I am wicked. My heart is wicked. It's evil. Uh, and without Christ, I am just a total disaster. 
But omitting the fact, that, and I shouldn't say omitting, but taking the fact and understanding where my heart is, but taking Jesus and saying, okay, I can't be holy, but you can. And so, just like Paul said, that I was crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. Okay, you've heard me quote that a lot over the last several months. But it's that thing of taking his life for our own. Okay, when we gave up our life, when we come to Christ and said, okay, I'm a new being. I'm a new person in Christ. I give up me. I no longer exist. It is Christ in me. And so the more that he can get out of me and pour himself through me, the better off I am. Okay? Uh, but it's not by anything I can do. I can't do anything to make myself holy before God. It's accepting the life of Christ in my own place, which is exactly what we did when we come to him at the foot of the cross. We're saying, God, I understand. I've got to have your blood. I've got to have your forgiveness. I've got, because I can't do it. And so... In all of that big picture, trading your life for his, which is what we did when we come to him, uh, but it's recognizing that. And so we get off the treadmill. It becomes a different life because we recognize there's no way for me to add up. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't have works because of your faith. It doesn't mean that you're not going to want to serve him and live for him and spend time with him and, and share with others about what God has done in your life. None of that, it doesn't mean anything that that's going to be any different. What that does mean, though, is the way that you do that is out of the understanding, I'm not doing all this trying to add up for God. He's not up there keeping a tally saying, well, you'd have been holy if you just shared Jesus with one more person. You know, it's recognizing that we can't be holy and living in that, walking in that day in and day out. Uh, of I can't do anything to add up. Does that make more sense? Did I confuse you more? Okay. All right. Did that confuse everybody else? Cam's laughing. Talk to me, Cam. No? All right, Clay. You ain't scared to ask a question or comment. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a short version. I went the long way around. I was trying to make sure that I I crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and nailed all the boards down good and tight. Yeah. So did I confuse anybody? If I did, I will try to do a better job explaining. Because that's that's big, okay? You need to get that. Because I lived a lot of my life. Uh, thinking that I had to add up, thinking that I had to do these things in order to be accepted before a holy God. And none of that exists. None of that is biblical. Go ahead. I do believe that uh, for any person that calls himself a Christian uh, will never be confused if anything's different. Right. If they are ever confused of being something different, then it's probably time to check yourself. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and God's continuing to soften those edges. And uh, more and more each and every year. Yeah, so, so yeah, so getting that right, understanding that it's not a continual um, process of trying to please God in order to make yourself holy before him, okay? You've got to nail that down. You've got to understand his blood at the cross, you traded your life for his. And that was the end of it. Okay. Now, everything out of your life that blossoms from that is out of your love for him and desire to live for him and the Holy Spirit flowing through you, changing your life to be more like God. That is the sanctification process, okay? If you're still trying to make yourself righteous and holy before him, you need to go back to the foot of the cross. And you got to settle it there, okay? If you're still trying to be holy and righteous before God, then you need to go back to the foot of the cross and settle it at the foot of the cross and get it right. 
Okay, that's why Paul talks about working out his faith with fear and trembling, okay? Wanting to make sure he had it right. Wanting to make sure he understood grace, okay? Wanting to make sure that he understood trading his life for the life of Christ, okay? That's that whole, I was buried in death, right, with Christ, and I was raised in his life, okay? So you get that picture of, I died. Um, we had, uh, I'll tell you this story real quick. Uh, and I may have shared this story. Uh, it's funny because Barry told me, he said, imagine being somewhere 20 years. You've told every story you have known at least two or three times, and you never remember what you tell. So I've only been here two years, and I don't remember what all stories I've told. So if it's another if it's a story you've already heard, I'm sorry. But it makes a great point, okay? Uh, many years ago, Dana and I had the privilege of housing two young ladies from Uganda, and they became our daughters, okay? Literally, they stayed with us for a good long time. I say good long time. Over the period of time. Um, and uh, we love them. If we could have adopted them and kept them at our house forever, we would have. But the thing with them in Uganda, when they came to Jesus, they got a new name. Kid you not. Whatever your birth name was, no longer existed. They literally gave you a brand new name. Why? Because they literally took it literal that when you traded your life for Jesus, you was no longer the old person. Okay? And so if I was born John, then I was given a new name at my date of salvation because I was no longer John. I traded my life for that, okay? It makes a great picture, right? It's trading your life for the life of Christ. You got a new life in him, okay? Make better sense? That was probably a great illustration. If I'd have told that 10 minutes ago, y'all probably could have got it all, right? So anyway, sorry. I do my, I try to explain and sometimes I over explain. I apologize for that. I just want to make sure there's no confusion if I possibly can. So, all right. Anything else on that? All right. We'll take a test on that next week. Um, just kidding. Uh, kind of. Uh, but... but the tax collector uh, right here, uh, bottom page 27, peace and cleansing, okay? Uh, anything that you underline, I know I've been talking for the past 40 minutes. So anything that you underline on the bottom of page 127 to the top of page 128. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I pretty much underline that whole page. So, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, we never come to a bro place, of, a position of brokenness that God doesn't show us the divine lamb on Calvary's cross. We've talked about this, and I know that I've beat this in the ground over the last uh, 12 weeks. You need to spend time in your mind visualizing the foot of the cross. And you may have to watch. Look, I know, I know that the, the movie, The Passion of the Christ, is not a real depiction. It's the closest thing I think we got that we can see. All right? I know there's some faults in it here and there. I get past that. But even if you need to go sit down and watch that movie again and recognize, visualize the best that you can, your Lord and Savior, not Jim Caviezel, your Lord and Savior on the cross for your sin. And settle it, okay? And so, therefore, you have a place. You understand exactly what he's talking about when he says that we never come to a position of brokenness, but that it shows us the divine lamb on Calvary's cross, putting away our sin by the shedding of his blood. Every drop that dripped, every beating that he took, everything that happened to him was to cover our sin. And so, I think... The, the, the repetitious theme throughout this whole book is don't take sin lightly. Over and over and over and over. Never get to a place of contentment with confessing your sins. Always allow our sins to bring us to a place of true brokenness. And I know this probably goes in against, I shouldn't say against. You probably... <laughs> But, but talking about coming to a place of brokenness, coming to that place has been something over my entire life that I've heard preached very little. And I've heard repentance of sin a lot. But being broken over your sin to me is just a different state, okay? I understand repenting and brokenness. It's, kind of, it's the same thing. But the level of understanding a place of brokenness, taking yourself to that place, to the foot of the cross, and understanding what God did for you is crucial. And we don't need to forget that. We need to meditate on that and think about that and ponder on that uh, because 
of what God did because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Um, it goes on to say in that paragraph, the God who declares beforehand, this is good, okay? The God who declares beforehand what we are provides beforehand for our sin. Now, you need to stop and think about that just for a minute because if you ain't careful, you'll run by that one, okay? The God who declared beforehand what we are provides beforehand for our sin. Jesus was the lamb for our sins from the what? In him who bore them in meekness, my sins are finished. What is that saying? What's that paragraph say to you? Okay. All right. He took up all our sin. What else? That's right. That's right. At the beginning of the foundation of the world, when it all began, remember, in the beginning was what? The Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? It goes back to what Jesus said. We created, right? Jesus was there in the beginning. He, God knew men would be wicked. They would have a wicked heart. They would need the blood of Christ in order to make us right with him. And so that's exactly what he's saying. The God who declared beforehand what we are provided, provides beforehand for our sin. In other words, he said, hey, look, I had a plan. In the beginning, I knew this was going to happen. I had a plan. I didn't get surprised by the fact that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I knew it was going to happen. I knew that the things that was going to happen. I knew that the laws were going to be created. I knew all these things. And he knew you and I before we were even formed in our mother's wombs, and he had a plan for our life. And before they created all of us and all of that, God had a plan that his son would go to the cross and shed his blood for you and me. Absolutely. And in him who bore them in meekness, my sins are finished. That's a big word, y'all. Finished. Done. Taken into account for. That's huge. Amen to that, brother. Praise God, there is no limit. That's right. Yeah. And as I, in true brokenness, confess them and put my faith in his blood, they are cleansed and gone. Praise the Lord. Peace with God then comes into my heart, and he immediately restores my fellowship with him, and I walk with him in what? White clean, pure, before a holy God. We can't do that. We can't do that, but God can. He can do that, and he has done that. And when we come to him in true brokenness, and we confess those sins, yeah, they go. They are gone. As we close out, there's so much left on this page and a half. We could talk about for quite some time. The simple way to being there on the right after that, the simple way of being willing to justify God and see the power of His blood to cleanse brings back uh, brings within our reach is never before a close walk with Jesus and a constant dwelling with Him in the holy of holies. And as we walk with Him in the light, He will be showing us all the time. That's walking in. Steady step with the Lord, right? As we walk with him in the light, he will be showing us all the time the beginnings of things that, if allowed to pass, will grieve him and check the flow of his life in us. Things that are the expression of that old proud self for which God has nothing but judgment. Think about that. Walking in step with step with him. We see the sins before they happen. We see those things those that where that proud self is going to rise up. Where we can avoid those things, right? We can stay away from that. We must at no point, bottom of the page, protest our innocence. Boy, we know how to do that well. Of all what he shows us. When we protest our innocence, that keeps us from a place of brokenness. That keeps us from allowing him to cleanse that. To take away that. To bring us into that place. 
All along, we must be willing to justify him and say what? You're right, Lord. That shows that just shows what I am and be willing to give it to him for cleansing. And as we do so, we shall find that his precious blood is continuously cleansing us from sin. The tide is being continuously healed at its beginning. And Jesus is continuously filling us with his spirit. Uh, there at the bottom it says, There then is our choice to protest our innocence and go down to our house unblessed, dry of soul and out of touch with God, or to justify God and enter into a peace, fellowship, and victory through the blood of Jesus. It's our choice. Yeah. It's our choice. We can either walk in a place of brokenness and a freedom of life uh, and a place of holiness in him and right fellowship with him, the victory in Christ because of the blood of Jesus. Or we can protest our innocence, drive up a stob, straighten up our necks, and be our own proud self. And sadly, we don't choose rightly every time, do we? We do not. But may we never forget this little book and what God has done in our life through it. Don't lay it down and walk off from it. Keep it somewhere close. Uh, you never know when you may want to pick it back up. God wants you to pick it back up and read it, study on it, spend some time on it. A lot of really, really, really good stuff in this book. And I pray that this is not the end of what God has done in and through your life. Okay. Anybody want to say anything before we go? I've held us over a couple minutes. All right. You know I'm not good at quick answers. Sorry. Do what? Read that again. Where are you at? Yes. 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 That is correct. Yes. Yeah, he begins to show us all the time the beginnings of things that if allowed to pass will grieve him and check the flow of his life in us. Yes, so he shows us those things that will grieve him, which grieves the Holy Spirit too, okay? And so, yes, that's, that's him showing us our sin, showing us our, uh, our life, showing us the things that are coming up. Uh, we've all seen those where we're getting involved in something or there's something at work or there's something in our home or there's something that uh, whatever the case may be that's coming up and we know how our old self will react. And so as we walk step in step with him, we see that. God will show us that before we step in the middle of it and have the opportunity to sin, okay? It's that foreknowledge of, hey, this is coming. And we see that. We know that. And it's just like someone saying, so-and-so is going to call you on the phone and have a conversation with you. Well, if so-and-so has tend to be a problem uh, in discussion with you, you know when you get on the phone they're going to be a problem. And so what do you do? You dread it, right? Yeah, I do. I don't do confrontation well, okay? Uh, and so, yeah, so I begin to build up a shield. And so God gives us that ability in our own lives as we walk step in step with him to see that forecoming sin, that forecoming self blossoming out because, hey, normally in this situation I would run my mouth off or I would fill in the blank whatever it is that I would do. And therefore God says, okay, in this situation, if it goes like this, how are you going to respond? And you have a time to be able to check yourself, so to speak, to hopefully keep yourself from walking in the way of your old self. And so, yeah, and grieving the Holy Spirit. So, does that make sense? Okay. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's pray. Father God, thank you.